Okay, so welcome to the second video on sperm motility, in which we are discussing um, how calcium oscillations are very important uh, in uh, producing an emphasic cyclic AMP oscillation, and then actually cyclic AMP produces sperm motility. Okay, so it's actually, um, as I just said in that introduction, cyclic AMP is what actually produces the motility of the sperm. So, basically, what we've seen so far is that if you have um, oscillations in calcium level within the cytoplasm of the sperm, then we get an in-phasic oscillation of the cyclic AMP level within the cytoplasm of the sperm. And this cyclic AMP is then what causes motility of the sperm. So, um, you would expect motility to be higher when cyclic AMP is higher and motility to be low when cyclic AMP is low. And that in is indeed what you see. You see bursts of movement, basically. Right. We then also said that if you um, just maintain a high concentration of calcium, you don't get any movement. And that is actually because if you maintain a high concentration of calcium, you don't get any cyclic AMP, uh, and therefore you don't get any movement. So cyclic AMP basically causes movement. The cyclic AMP level is, is related to how much movement you get. But the production of cyclic AMP isn't determined by your absolute level of calcium. Instead, it seems to be determined by um, a change, the change in uh, calcium level. So if calcium suddenly jumps up, that causes a spike in the level of cyclic AMP, basically. Okay, so what we want to do is try and understand the mechanisms underlying this now. Okay, so to understand why it's a change, a derivative of calcium level that um, produces um, a, a, an activation of adenylyl cyclase 8, let's have a look at the mechanism by which adenylyl cyclase 8 is activated by calcium. Okay, so this, if this is the phospholipid bilayer, then the structure of adenylyl cyclase 8 is as follows. You have this first transmembrane domain, which consists of six membrane-spanning alpha helices, then you have the C1 loop, and then you have the second transmembrane domain here, and then you have the C2 domain down here. So this is the C1 loop divided into two portions, C1A and C1B here, and this is the C2 domain here, which is divided again into two portions, C2A and C2B. And then you have the N terminus over here, which has a very special no domain known as the calmodulin recruitment domain here. So this is calmodulin recruitment domain. Right, okay, so um, let me just finish writing this and then I'll tell you how um, adenylyl cyclase 8 is actually regulated by calcium. Okay, so adenylyl cyclase 8 does not actually have its own uh, calcium sensing domain. So it cannot sense calcium on its own. It relies on the protein calomodulin. Okay, so let's go over the structure of calomodulin for how many umpteenth time. So the structure of calomodulin, basically. Um, calomodulin, when it's unbound to calcium, has this sort of structure in cartoons, at least. It has two lobes, an N lobe and a C lobe. Okay, and uh, each of these lobes has two calcium binding sites, and these calcium binding sites are specifically EF hand domains. So an EF hand is just a um, it's just a loop of polypeptide effectively. So let me just discuss this. It's just a loop of polypeptide, and in this loop down here, most of the amino acids that you have are acidic residues, which means that they can donate their proton, and when they do donate their proton, the uh, what's left gets a negative charge because the proton that they've lost had a positive char charge, so what's left gets a negative charge. So you end up with a lot of negatively charged uh, R groups facing into the center here, and that's where the calcium ion can basically bind. So you have, on each of these lobes of calmodulin, you have dimers of EF hands, like so. So you have two EF hand uh, domains uh, linked together, and that's known as an EF hand dimer. So in each of these lobes of calmodulin, you have two calcium binding sites because you have uh, in each one a dimer of EF hand domains. Okay, so overall, calmodulin has four calcium binding uh, domains, and um, when calcium is not bound to calmodulin, the name of this structure you have here is apocalmodulin, like so. 
okay, uh, which is often denoted ApoCaM for calmodulin. Right, now, when calcium binds to apocalmodulin, binds to the four calmodulin, uh, calcium binding sites of calmodulin, what happens is that calmodulin structure changes. The lobes um, sort of move so that they are less compacted. They move outwards. And then this link uh, between the two lobes of calmodulin, uh, it was linear, but now it changes so that it has an alpha helical like structure here. Well, an, uh, not an alpha helical like structure, an alpha helix. So basically, those are the two, two changes that calmodulin undergoes when it binds calcium. It, the two lobes move further apart and it becomes less compact. And this uh, linker between the two lobes goes from having a linear structure to having a alpha helical structure. Okay, right, so I need to draw the calcium actually bound in those calcium binding sites. Right, so uh, this structure now with four calciums bound and in this other conformation is then known as a calcium calmodulin complex, so Ca2 plus calmodulin complex, and it's often abbreviated to Ca2 plus CAM for short. Okay, right, so uh, what happens to activate this adenylalcyclase 8 enzyme over here, what happens is initially the apocalmodulin, i.e. this calmodulin structure with no calcium bound to it, it binds to this calmodulin recruitment domain here. So here's apocalmodulin bound to the calmodulin recruitment domain. Okay, and then what has to happen is when calcium goes up in the cell, in the cytoplasm of the cell, then what's going to happen is that this apocalmodulin, uh, sorry, the apocalmodulin is going to get calcium bound to it. So calcium is going to come along and bind to the four binding domains on this apocalmodulin that are currently unoccupied. Now, when calcium comes and binds to those four binding sites, Firstly, the apocalmodulin turns into a calcium calmodulin complex, and also what you get is the um, the movement of this calcium calmodulin complex from the calmodulin recruitment domain to this C2B domain over here. Okay, and when calcium bind, uh, calcium calmodulin complex is bound to this C2B domain, it promotes the dimerization of the two catalytic domains. So in order to activate the adenylcyclase 8 enzyme, what you have to do is you have to dimerize the C1A domain with the C2A domain, because these two bits are the actual active enzyme. Uh, it's basically split into two at the moment, so it's inactive, but when you put those two together, they make the active enzyme. And when calcium calmodulin is bound to C2P, it promotes the, their dimerization and therefore the formation of the active enzyme. So let me show this. Okay, so here's the transmembrane domain 1 again. Here's the C1 loop. Transmembrane domain 2 again here. And then uh, C2A there, C2B. Right, so they're now... Uh, C2A is now dimerized with C2B here to make the active enzyme, and down in C2, oh sorry, this is C2A, I do apologize, C1A and C2A have now dimerized, these two bits that make the active enzyme have dimerized here, okay, and um, calcium calmodulin is now bound to this C2B region over here, so this is calcium calmodulin bound there. Okay, and this is now the active enzyme. Right, so that's the way in which calcium calmodulin um, complex, well, calcium going up, actually activates the um, adenylalcyclase 8 enzyme. Because now, now that you've got the active enzyme formed, it's going to catalyze the reaction where you take an ATP and you break it down into cyclic AMP and pyrophosphate. Okay, right, uh, so... Uh, next step, what we need to try and explain is why a continuously high calcium level does not stimulate this enzyme. Why only a change in calcium? Why this graph, basically? Why, when calcium goes up, do you initially get a spike in cyclic AMP, i.e. do you initially get this enzyme activated, and then what happens afterwards? Why does the continually high calcium not keep this activated? And basically, it's because, well, this is a speculation. This is, um, this is 
cutting edge science now. This is something that there's still research going into, but this is a speculation and a, a theory that a lot of people would back. Basically, the thought is that it's because you have to get this transfer, basically. So imagine now that we have continuously high calcium levels in the cell. Well, what's going to happen? All the apocalmodulin is going to be converted into calcium calmodulin complexes. So there's no apocalmodulin left in the cell. Now, that means there's no apocalmodulin to bind to this calmodulin recruitment domain. Okay? So, you can't get apocalmodulin binding to this calmodulin recruitment domain. Now, you might say, well, does that matter? Because we've got the calcium calmodulin complex bound to our C2B, so it doesn't matter that we can't bind any more apocalmodulin to our calmodulin recruitment domain. Well, the reality is, this calcium calmodulin complex will eventually fall off, and then the enzyme will inactivate, well, it will deactivate, it will uh, once the calcium calmodulin complex is gone, the um, dimerization of these two C1A and C2A will gradually fall apart. And can you activate the enzyme again? No, because to activate the enzyme again, you need to have apocalmodulin initially bound to the calmodulin recruitment domain, which is then transformed into calcium calmodulin complex and transferred to C2B. Now, if all of the ca if calcium is continually high in the cell, then all of the calcium calmodulin com uh, all of the calmodulin will be in the form of calcium calmodulin complexes, and therefore you won't be able to get this cascade because calcium calmodulin complexes cannot just directly bind to C2B. It has to go through this apocalmodulin then transfer onto C2P when the apocalmodulin has been converted to calcium calmodulin complex. So if you've just got continuously high calcium levels, you can't stimulate adenylyl cyclase 8. And now let's look at this graph here. So calcium starts off low. That means that all the calmodulin will be in the form of apocalmodulin. Well, most of it anyway. So apocalmodulin will be able to bind to the calmodulin recruitment domain. Then, when calcium initially goes up, what happens? This perfect activation happens. Calcium comes in, binds to all four of the domains on this apocalmodulin bound to the calmodulin recruitment domain of the adenylyl cyclase 8, and then it's transferred to C2B, and then that activates the enzyme. Okay, so for a while, you get um, activation of adenylyl cyclase 8, cyclic AMP goes up. But if calcium remains high, then now all of the apocalmodulin in the cytoplasm has been converted into calcium calmodulin complexes. And what's going to gradually happen is this calcium calmodulin complex that was attached to C2B and was activating the adenylyl cyclase 8 enzyme is going to fall off. When it falls off, then this enzyme becomes inactivated again. Okay? And can you go through the process of activating it again? Absolutely not, because there's no apocalmodulin. It's all in the form of calcium calmodulin complex. So, what you need to do, basically, is you need calcium to go back down. Because if calcium goes back down, then you go back to having apocalmodulin. It can bind to the calmodulin recruitment domain again, and then you're all primed and ready to go. So when calcium goes back up again, this process of activation can happen again, but it can't happen once you just keep a calcium level as a constant high, basically. If you do that, all the calmodulin is just in the form of calcium calmodulin complexes, and you can't go through this activatory process. And that is why oscillations in calcium are important for activating adenylyl cyclase 8. And if you just have a continuously high level, yes, okay, the instant you move it up, you'll get activation of the uh, adenylyl cyclase 8, but then afterwards, it'll just stop, basically. It needs changes. It needs you to go up and down and up and down, basically. Okay, so that's a, that's a, a speculative theory that makes a lot of sense. A speculative model, and all science is models. It's a model for how um, uh, cyclic AMP levels um, will rise in response to oscillations in calcium rather than just high levels of calcium. And then cyclic AMP, uh, then um, the absolute level of cyclic AMP then determines how motile the sperm is. So what you get is bursts of oscillate or of movement in that tail of the sperm, basically.